Every month, the hedge fund Jane Street will post a puzzle to their website. If you finish the puzzle within a month, you will get your name up on the leaderboard. 24 seven, four and one. The solution's already out since this has been uh, out for a couple months, but there's my name on the leaderboard right there. They give us this weird unfilled looking Sudoku thing, and then they set a bunch of rules for us. And full transparency, it's been a couple months since I did this, so I'm probably gonna be a little rusty with it. Place numbers in some of the empty cells of the grid so that in total each of the four seven by seven outline grids is a legal 24 seven grid. Okay, by seven by seven grid, they mean future Chris here. This is the first one, this as the second one, the third one, and the fourth one. So they overlap through these middle sections here. So each seven by seven section should contain one, one, two, two, et cetera, et cetera, up to seven sevens. So for each seven by seven section of this grid, there could be only one one. The one that they gave us is the only one in this entire box. And then there's a two here, but we know that there's a two somewhere else here. Maybe it's here, maybe it's there, anywhere in this like square here. Same thing with uh, the rest, three threes, four fours, et cetera. Okay, and then this other part, furthermore, each row and column within the seven by sevens must contain exactly four numbers, which sum to 20. In this row, for example, we know we can only have a total of 20. So if there's like a six here and a five here, then we know that last number needs to be a five because that would sum to 20 with these three. So there would need to be a five somewhere in one of the blank spots. So that's another thing to keep in mind. And that goes for rows and columns. Finally, the numbered cells must form a connected region, but every two by two sub square in the completed grid must contain at least one empty cell. A two by two sub square is like something like this, and it means that we cannot have four numbers within this zone here. Okay, the numbered cells must form a connected region, connected through orthogonally adjacent, which means that like there needs to be something to the uh, top left, right, or bottom of it. If there's a number here, this would not be considered connected to the four. The numbers that we fill in for this grid here and for all four of these, they need to be completely connected. Maybe there's numbers that, that are like here and moving connected here, 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 something like this, right? So eventually we'll have like something that's kind of connected numbers across the whole the whole thing. So some blue numbers have been placed outside the grid. A number outside the grid represents either the sum of the row or the column it is facing or the value of the first number it sees in that row or column. When it says the sum of the row or column, it means the entire column or the entire row. We're not just talking about the seven by seven smaller square anymore. For example, in this row right here, this is a good one. This is a two. And so we know obviously this entire row is not going to sum to two because each section within the seven by seven grid needs to be 20. So I guess the minimum number that this could be, one of these numbers could be, if it was the sum is 26. If it's smaller than 26, then we know for sure it's just the first number that appears in this column or row. So back to this two, we know that there's a two in one of these spots here, either there or there. I remember the first thing I did, use this sketch pad and write out. Basically, I just created the numbers for the square and then I could kind of like move them around as I like figured out rules and eliminate certain boxes and things like that. One one here, two twos here, three threes here, four fours here, five fives here, six sixes here, seven sevens here. Click on them and move them to wherever I want. This will make solving this top left seven by seven grid a little bit easier. So this 40 on the side, basically refers to the sum of the entire row. And we know that in each seven by seven section, we need to have a sum of 20 in this zone right here, a sum of 20 in this zone right here. The only way it's possible for that to add up to 40 is if there's nothing in these middle two squares. So there's 20 here and 20 here. If we had, for example, a five in one of these, then we'd only have 15 here, 15 here, and then this row would sum to 35 instead of 40. So because this is 40, we know that there's nothing in these middle two squares and same idea going up and down. Because there's a 40 here, we know that there's nothing in this square or this square here. Yeah, some of this is coming back to me now. So the top left here, the five and the six, we know that that's going to be a first number, not the total sum. Let's say that a five is placed here. We know that a five can't be here because the first spot of this row and column would be a five and that breaks the rule of the top six. So we know that nothing can be in this top spot. This is like another spot that we know nothing is in. Looking at this, we also know that we cannot place a six here to be like the first spot of this column because this six would basically go against the rule that this seven would be, is setting down. We need to move this six like to, I guess, at least down here. And one other thing we know from these outside numbers, right? When there's a number less than 40, we know that these spots are actually not going to be empty. And we know that because we're basically overlapping numbers here that are going to get added to this 20 over here 
as well as the 20 over here. And so there's gonna be this overlap zone. And so I know that the sum within these two squares needs to be 12, all right? Basically 40 minus whatever this number is. So I know that the sum here needs to be 12, right? And this could be a couple different numbers, right? It could be seven, five, it could be six, six. I guess that's pretty much it, right? Wherever we see a 27, yeah, that's 13. And the only way we can get 13 is from a six and a seven. I guess we'll apply it here, right? I know that here, there needs to be a six and a seven in these two spots. I don't know which one is which, but I know for a fact there's a six and a seven here. So I'll just move a six and a seven here just to keep track of things right now. For this 34, technically both of these squares don't necessarily need to be occupied. It could be just a six and a zero, six in like an empty square. Let's look at this column right here with the 36, right? If we're looking at it from the perspective of this bottom left seven by seven grid, if there's only four numbers in this section right here, but we know that this needs to be 20, and because this is a 36, we know that this zone needs to be 40. So theoretically speaking, from the perspective of the top grid, maybe we could, we could be like, oh, there's a two here and a two here that makes 40, you know, whatever, that's good enough. But from this perspective of the bottom grid, that doesn't make any sense because we have a six and a five here. Like we have these are like, you know, set by the, by Jane Street that a six and a five need to be here. And so we cannot have a two and a two here because this would not sum to 20. And if that won't sum to 20, then we basically know for a fact that we need in this spot right here, we need, we need a four in one of these. And if our two is not here, then our two needs to be here. And so these like combinations of rules would be really helpful. And also, I guess let's think about it. We know that this two is, is here first, for sure. We know that there's a four in one of these and we know that there was a six and seven in this section right here right but this is another rule too this one is permanent right and if we have a one on any particular row we basically need super super high numbers for the rest of that row to get to the sum of 20. we need two sixes and a seven right we could also i guess have two sevens and a five on any row with a one, we basically cannot have anything four, three, or two whatsoever. So then we know that one of these two spots is definitely not occupied with a four, three, or two. So, and we know it's not occupied with a five and a one for the six. And so we know that there's gonna be a six in one of these spots as well. You can throw like a six here to identify it's one of these. And I guess this kind of would tell us actually our first row for sure, right? So we know we need a six or seven here. We have our six here, we have our two here. We know we need a four in one of these. So if the four was here we need to think like would this actually work right we have a six six four two that's 18 that's not 20. we need this six here and if this six is here then we know the for sure the four is here and this also kind of allows us to cross off some more spots you know we also know that this cannot be occupied this spot cannot be occupied. We again know there's a four here. This tells us a little bit more information about this row. We also know that this, there cannot be anything right here. Four, four, seven, this is equal to 15. And this needs to be 20 as well. So we know for a fact, we need a five right here. I'm gonna see how long it would take me to do this again from scratch. I got this top left. Honestly, that took me a lot longer than I thought. I think it took me like 30 or 40 minutes. You can kind of see the process I took. Break down the different rules, combine them together, eliminate things, make sure I mark it down. It's probably kind of similar to how you do Sudoku. I'm not super familiar with that, but the seven by seven grid number two and three, like on the bottom left and top right, are probably gonna be a little bit easier than the first one. But I remember this last section being pretty hard. Um, yeah, overall, honestly, this problem is a lot harder than I remember it. First time I did it, I think it took me a couple weeks. Like I just like work on it for like 30 or 40 minutes when I got home after work, that kind of thing. I was able to like slowly push through it, but I would like make mistakes. I eliminated a number when I shouldn't have or whatever. The solution to solving this problem really isn't complicated. It's just tedious. You could definitely make this complicated. Discrete optimization could solve you this problem, but it's gonna require slightly sophisticated programming. Now, if you needed to solve a hundred of these puzzles, you like if you had a whole booklet and it's like, all right, solve a hundred of these as quickly as possible, then you probably want to invest the time and then you can just have it run through all hundred. The main reason I made this video is because the other Jane Street puzzle video I made actually ended up doing pretty well. It got like a thousand views in like a week. If you haven't seen that one, go check it out. I think that's it for me today. See ya.